What are we talking about? Well, you have been being a big nerd over a guy who is called the Orient. <laughs> the Orient? The, uh, what was it? Or Rams. <laughs> M&M's? M- <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this guy who I believe is a medieval athlete, thinker, thinker. He says things that we dis- we do agree with. <laughs> we do agree with. And we want to sing. No. Songs. About. M&M's. There you go. Welcome to New Polity. Welcome to Good Money, the the <laughs> podcast that we just named and is difficult to remember. Um, here we are talking about Nicola Rem today. Nicola Rem, was, yeah. No, people think. I think I'm going to introduce yeah. this. Okay, yeah, because you've been your guy. So I literally far. have not read the guy. So wow, that's crazy. Uh, people think that because of all the animosity that the church has demonstrated towards money and financiers through the years, yeah. that there would have been a lot written about money. Right. Like you consider that one council where they said, if you like money, you're a big loser. Yeah. 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 Like that one council. And uh, it was the seventh Steubenville council. Yeah. Wasn't it? Page yeah. 30. Four, 34. And... The, uh, but actually, so I actually went back and I tried to find all and just gather up all the different treatises on money that the church wrote. And there was not one from the patristic era. Really? Nobody wrote in a single treatise. I couldn't even find hardly a statement on the nature of money. The nature really well. And then I went to the scholastic era and I couldn't find hardly anybody that said anything well i could find a lot of people that said things about money like little statements here and there shortened uh little abbreviated ideas yeah. and law yeah like aquinas yeah 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 only one treatise on money mm. and that was by nicola rem and so i started yeah. to i was just like all right i don't know anything about you nicola rem tell me about yourself and and he said dominus vibiscum <laughs> because he wrote in Latin. That's right. That's right. Well, he wrote in Old French. He was, oh, that's the, right. he was the first scholastic to write treatise in Old French. Super cool. Um, translating Aristotle into Old French. First time that happened. That was awesome. And to him, really, it was New French. So It was New French. Yeah. So what are we calling it Old French for? Uh, and even he said at one point that his French isn't very good. Um, oh, okay. be- and because he had been trained in Latin gotcha. and was thinking all his intellectual thoughts in Latin. And he ended up making up 450 words in French <laughs> just to be able to get his thoughts through, uh, you know, loan words from, from Latin for the most part or changing with French endings. And yeah. so you're welcome, all French people. He gave you 450 words that you use regularly. A veritable Shakespeare. Indeed. So I started saying, okay, who is this guy? And Nicole Arem was born in the middle of nowhere to a family that we don't really know much about. Uh, I've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so he was not really discovered to be a great intellectual mind until later in life. And I think he ended up going to the University of Paris when he was 28 years old, Mm -hmm. when most people were going as teenagers. Gotcha. Oh, he probably got made fun of. (laughs) So imagine, you know, gosh, what was that? Billy Madison. Wow. Yeah, movie? yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, where he like had to go through like kindergarten and everything. Classic yeah. Adams. Yeah. Adam Sandler is finalist. Yeah, yeah, it is. Sandler. I hardly matter. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but uh, so he went through, and he was made to you know found to be very, very intelligent, very, very smart. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, graduates and is immediately named the master of the College of Navarre which is a great college at the University of Paris at the time, and at mm-hmm. the time was the greatest university in the world. So cool. rags to riches, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that was happening at that time was that he, uh, that the king was actually captured. Yeah, Jean Le Bon, uh, John II was, was captured by the English king, Edward, and was taken over to England. Now, in the, I think it was a five years previous uh, that the currency was and there. So, and so there was a huge bounty on his head. Gotcha. You know, it's like French people pay me this amount or else I'm not giving you your king back. 
So the king was thinking about just devaluing all his <laughs> currency and then like, all right, just pay him with all this, you know, devalued currency so that we can you know, get more king for your buck. <laughs> and uh, and he had done that a ton, I think 71 times in the five years previous. Wait, he, because he kept getting kidnapped? <laughs> I, no, just because he wanted to buy stuff for free. Oh, I see. Yeah. So he was about to do this, but wasn't really sure because it was going to have to be a big devaluation. Yeah. And his son's favorite tutor, the Dauphin, Charles, the future King Charles V, said, you should really ask my favorite tutor about this. Wow. And so the King of England deigned to request counsel from Nicola Rem. Wait, I thought it was the King of France that wanted to devalue the money. What did I say? The King of England was getting counsel from. Oh no, Aram. I totally missed it's that. The up. King of France, yeah. the guy counsel. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure. All right, thanks for that. I just figured, me. like in this pretty cool narrative, the King of England is not the one who's. No, like, King of England is just well. He definitely doesn't want devalued currency, but he doesn't really know any of this is happening. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, he writes him this treatise, De Moneta, on money, where he talks about the nature of it, and pretty much is like, this is this is his answer. I just like okay. he's a nerd. No, it's just awesome. Can you imagine? I'm I, I, like the sometimes, you know, you talk about this kind of continuity between the Middle Ages, like they weren't this crazy time, like things were really. But, but then you hear about something like that, where it's like a kidnapped like ruler is like trying to get some help. Yeah. And what he gets is an academic treatise. <laughs> I love that. Like imagine if Trump, right, was like captured by the Chinese and is like. Like I don't I, know what to do. I don't know what to do, but I'm thinking what I might do is 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 bomb them, and and like is that what I should do? And then his advisors are like, "Well, on violence." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and well, this is already like steep into the decline of the Middle Ages. You know, wow. Andrew Jones always tells us that you know after the 13th century everything's downhill, and okay. this is after the 13th oh, century. Okay. You know, this is in the second half of the 14th century. So pretty impressive. All right, yeah. so so here we go. Yeah, so he writes in this treatise, yeah. and the king is convinced, and they don't. They don't do it. Wow. Devalue the currency, and he stays in captivity. <laughs> As the old French would say, c'est incroyable. Yeah. 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 Uh, then his son, Charles V, mm -hmm. who was tutored by Arem, and yeah. those scholars out there that say that he wasn't, I don't believe you. You do not convince me. Pretty sure he did. Cool. Well, uh, uh, Charles V is then like, bro, Nicole, you're a smart cookie, and yep. I don't really know what I'm doing totally, so mm -hmm. how about you help me out more and more and more? Yeah. So this master of the college ends up helping the king more and more and more he gets paid too much by the king for doing those temporal tasks where the university actually says hey you're not allowed to be the master and make so much money wow if only that's how it works yeah right yeah <laughs> so he ends up leaving and he's becomes a uh, rector at a at a uh, parish near oh he's near a priest king. he's a priest oh, this whole time sorry he's a priest Man of God, man of the cloth. Dude, he is cloth. Father Seamus. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, maybe it's O-Rem. O-Rem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you, Father O-Rem. When you become a priest, you do get an O or sometimes a Mick. Yeah, a Mick, Mick Rem. So he's he's a priest. Yeah. And he becomes a rector near, uh, near Charles V so that he could be more of an advisor to him. And he really becomes more and more of an advisor. He first gets sent around as being... A diplomat to help with some negotiations to help build up goodwill with other countries. Uh, the Pope is in Avignon at this point, and so he's going over visiting him, giving him sermons, all the stuff. He ultimately arises so high as to um, be the secretary of the of the king, and so this is. Uh, this, this means that he actually has the power to sign bills and to, and to act. Um, wow. Yep. So you f we find certain things that say Secretary Nicole Reb with a signature on it. Uh, and it's a really big deal. He's the head of the Chamber of Commerce or of accounts, as we might say. Um, and, and even at one point was designated a spy 
to look after somebody that uh, that Charles V thought to be treacherous, mm. treasonous. Even. Mm. So, uh, so he's he's a he's a he's a financial guru. He's a diplomat. He's a spy. He's a priest, and then ultimately he's named Bishop of Le Sou. Wow. So ultimately, where where the little flower is from? Wow. So this is a cool guy. What a guy. What a guy. And he writes this awesome treatise. Yeah. And then he continues, Charles V, throughout his rest of his career, is still asking him help. And so he's, he writes commentaries for him on the politics as well of Aristotle and the economics of Aristotle, yeah. ethics of Aristotle, and on the celestial spheres and such. And so, and, and he has a political philosophy that, surprise, surprise, is very much like what Louis the Ninth was, St. Louis. Uh, because he understood what a good and holy sacramental kingdom was like. He saw France moving away from it okay. under the reign of guys like Philip V and, and John II and said, we need to return to this, mm. that the common good needs to be primary, that the that positive laws need to be squelched as much as possible. Really? Uh, that they can only exist in small communities, that governable communities have to be surveyable territory, so really small. Wow. Um, that they have to be large enough to be self-sustaining, but also small enough so that the king might not ultimately become a tyrant. And he thinks that a king necessarily becomes a tyrant at the very point where he doesn't know his subjects. Wow. Wow, we are far past that point. I know. Okay. Yeah, we're we'll very, on. very far. We're much bigger than that. You know, at least three times. At least three times that size. <laughs> um, and and he wants us to come back to a place where the law is something that is built into custom. Okay. That is not subject to the king's uh, likings. He he had no time for executive orders. And uh, and thought that when there was a decision that was going to a, a legal decision that was going to affect the entire community, every single citizen had to agree on it. Really? Yeah. Wow. So this it's not a traditional democracy. Yeah. That he likes, but but when it came to positive law, like people need to ensure that they weren't being taken over by a despot. Yeah. Wow. Um, which was happening a lot in England sure. at this time. Again. Andrew Jones' is whole after the 13th century yeah, sure. starts to go the hell in the Okay, okay, okay. But here we are on good money, and I want to know why... He's good on money? He's good on money. <laughs> well, because this the, his first principle is, is this, is that you cannot have... You cannot make up what money is. Mm. Because once it's... It, once money is not something that is attuned to the natural order, mm -hmm. but is attuned to the king's own liking, mm -hmm. then he's going to take advantage of you. Gotcha. And it's just bound to happen. And he keeps, throughout his treatise, he keeps saying, why, so if you really think that we need to devalue currency right now, why would that happen if it wasn't just for the sake of the king and his own gain? Well, it could be that you just run out of precious metals in town. Okay, maybe that's the case. He'll say stuff like this, like, and that would be a fine motivation. But at that point, it needs to be well publicized that everybody knows what the exact proportion of precious metal to, to worthless metal is in every coin. Let us have no... So he wants us to get as far away from legal fictions as we possibly can. Gotcha. And, and that applies to money. Yeah. Um, which Aristotle, he thinks, is a part of law, um, meaning most profoundly custom. That, that sorry that money is part money of law. is yeah, yeah. Which, you know goes back to the idea that it's um like we hear the word new we're, we're making it yeah yeah we're making it and it, and then and then it participates in forming the order of our society yeah. mm -hmm. so there's law sure. uh and he even says that within it or sorry in just to get kind of a fun etymological point for people who like language like me numismatics it's like study of coinage it comes from the greek word namas meaning law fun I don't know if I would say that's fun, Jacob. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're gonna send our children over to you to be to, cool, to learn how to have fun. Yeah. Anyways, oh. the, but the but the biggest thing that I I think yeah. there's many important things that Arem offers us, but the most important one is that at the 
is, is this understanding of how the financial sector rises up in conformity with the state mm. at the very moment that you change the nature of money. Okay. You know, money's an artifact. So you can change its nature. It's no problem. It's not like a human, which natures you can't change. Once you make, once you start to treat some, so let's just let not get theoretical. You have a gold coin, 24 carats. It's awesome. Um, by the way, don't let anybody tell you that 24 carats gold is soft. It's soft for a metal. If you bite it, you're going to have to go to the dentist. It's not true. This is why you can still make jewelry out of it. And you can shop online at Monet.com. How's that for a plug for a look at the saints collection. It's yeah, beautiful. I want to kick back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, but the point here for, for a REM is that uh, if you have, you have precious metals, yeah. then people know what the coin is. Yeah. There's a certain weight that goes along with it. Uh, the, you can have certain pillars in your society that check for the proper weight of these coins that ensures that it truly is 24 carats and not something else. But at the very moment that, that the king starts to alloy these, these coins, meaning they put a little bit of worthless tin in there and take out some of the precious metal and then collect all the more of the precious metal to make more coins for himself that he's then able to spend without anybody recognizing that the, that there is now the, that the metal is less worth while than it yes. was before. Yep. That it's more worthless than yep. it was before. That's at the very point that he's literally taken some of your hard-earned money and then is able to spend it on you and to do more work for him. Right. So it ultimately gets to the point of stealing. Uh, Arem makes the great point in his treatise when he talks about Pharaoh. Um, heavy taxes for seven years. Yep. Then there's heavy famine for, for seven years and all the people come to him and say, please, please, please give us, give, give us your, uh, give us the grain that you have. And so he says, okay, well give me your money. So they, they give everything that they have and then they give, they say, we, we don't have any more money. And they says, well, give me your cattle, cattle yeah. all the cattle. And then he says, you know, we don't, they all say to him, we don't have any more cattle. Left. Well, give me your land, give them all the land. And they said, we don't have anything now but we still need food. The Pharaoh says, well then sell yourselves, yeah. you know, sell you in this slavery. And, and Arem s discusses this and he says that it must, citing Cassiodorus actually, and he says, says it, he could not imagine the state that these people were in where the sweet relief of bread was better than servitude. Than the, than the cur current, the, or, yeah, I totally ruined that. That, that that the that the trials of slavery yeah. were were less disturbing, damning, trying than their starvation. Yeah. But he says that was better. Like what Pharaoh did was not as bad as a king devaluing currency, because here's the difference: the people knew mm. they voluntarily sold themselves right. into slavery. But for the king who takes up the extra gold and then spends it on you working for him, well, you don't even know that you've been turned into slaves. Does that make sense? Not yet, because when you say spend it on you. Um, so let me, let's me let say this. Yeah, let's, okay. do, let's do a little thing. Okay. I'm the king. Hey. Um, I need to uh, re-mint these coins right. because they're getting old. Oh, my Lord. Uh, of course you do. Yeah. You so give me all your coins because, you know, it's the medieval society, so you don't really use these all the that off. That's right. Let me take them up from under the floorboard and give you 10. Okay. I'll take your 10. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Now I got 10 coins. I'm going to take them to the mints and re-mint these, except I'm going to put... Oh, a little bit more tin in these. You don't. You don't know, I don't know that I'm what, doing this. I don't know he's doing it. Well, no, no, you're my advisor. Hi. Hey, advisor, go get me some tin. Tin. Uh, yes, my lord. I will go to the mountains of tin. <laughs> and here you go. Thank you. Now let's melt these down. Yep. Let's put a little bit of tin in here. Now we got 15 coins. Oh, you're an alchemist. You're brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. I'm brilliant. I am an alchemist. Uh, hey, here's your, your newly minted coins back. Wait, am I still the advisor? No, no, okay, you're, wait, you're, wait, sorry. Wait, no, okay. you're the, yep. you're the citizen guy. 
I'm about to humble shit to shit. <laughs> Go on then. There's your 10 coins. Yeah, they, thank you. Yeah, there you are. Right, they, 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 oh, look at how oh. the design's even better. I updated the design. Is that great? That's really nice. Yeah, it's really nice. A little more nice. minimalistic. We're moving towards modernity. I yeah. can tell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Soon we'll have states. Okay. No, you don't realize that there's any tin in there. Uh, yeah, I know. I, okay, I'm just okay. saying it's pretty. Yeah, yeah, you're just saying it's pretty. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now I come to you, knock on your door again. Hey. Hi. Hey. Oh, my uh, lord, to be graced with a visit for, from someone so gracious. Well, you know what? I just heard that you make the best bread in town. Uh, that's right. So uh, I'll give you two coins so that you can make me bread. That's the normal rate, is right, it not? Right, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, here is your bread. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Coins. Look what just happened there. Wow, you're right. I get it now. Yeah, I didn't do anything. Yep. I just took money from you. Yep. And so pretty much you just gave me free bread. Yep. I and I had money left over. I get it. It's bad. It's very, very, very bad. So that that is the problem. Like okay, okay. Alchemy okay, yeah, yeah. is, and he even condemns alchemy because, which is different than St. Thomas. St. Thomas says that if you can actually make precious metals, then like use them. Like it's valid money at that point. Okay. Whereas Arem says, well, you've just busted up the natural order. Okay. And you have made something that had a fewer quantity, more a greater quantity, and now you're making people work for yeah, you for it free. sounds like probably the right take, especially given uh, alchemy's associations with things that are very not Christian. Yeah, totally. But yeah, okay, cool. So so this is this is his move. Now, uh, and of course, like in our current fiat system, the alchemy problem is solved because they just print more money and all of a sudden there's more money instead of having to like do chemical reactions to yeah, get they, fake gold. It turns out that faith is um, the actual secret to how to create gold. Oh, wow. Now, Arem takes this point further and he says, okay, so these people are working. Yep. They don't realize that they're slaves, but they're slaves. Yes. And it's very sneaky because the same order is, is going on. However, there are going to be those sneaky financiers that catch wind of the king doing this. Yeah. And they are going to stockpile the old coinage mm. and wait for the new cheaper stuff to arrive. Wow. And ultimately, people are going to realize that this this coinage is cheaper, yeah. is not worth as much. And therefore, they're going to charge more. Charge more Instead yeah. of the two coins for bread, they're going yeah. to start charging. So it's not even effective except for a time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But what the bankers can do, Aram says, is that they can know when this period is coming up. And they can stock up on the old coinage, yep. and they can even go out and get different coins from from elsewhere. Right. So yep. at a point, they are doing. They also are gaining wealth right. without doing any work, just by knowing different financial techniques. Right. So it's just power, and then the power that comes from sorry, power, and then the power that comes from position essentially is rewarded for without any work. Yep. Yep. Now at this point, which is really interesting, you actually have certain people rising up in society becoming more powerful and thus having a certain level of domination over the citizenry and then there becomes there is a tension between the government and the banks mm. does that sound kind of familiar it does it sounds like um well, our discussion of jubilees actually when mm. uh there is a tension between uh those um lenders who people are in debt to and then their debt to the king yeah um yeah 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 it also kind of just sounds like for the ancient mesopotamian, for the ancient mesopotamian society yeah, yeah. But, but you were trying to make a point about today i think what's that were you trying to say it sounds familiar to today yeah um, yeah yeah um, i think it's just it's just familiar it's just ha something that happens yeah but so either you have these rival powers in society yep. and that's pretty much what people think today like the republican democrat divide but what it ultimately comes down to is that, that they unify as one class because they need one another, the financiers, to be able to know when the change is going to happen. The king needs the financiers. To, he, he helps them arise in society because they could take him over at a certain point, mm -hmm. hold his bluff, throw him out as a despot, as a tyrant. And so they really end up ruling the entire country together. Always viciously, always in tension with one another, but they become one force. Okay, so so does this have an analogy to what we do today? Because obviously we don't have gold coins and we don't mix them with tin. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but I, I'm sensing that there is. Yeah, well, and it's it's really sad, and I don't say this conspiratorially or anything like that. It's just, I mean, this is, it's not even well documented. It's just like, it, it is well documented, but it's even just in the public news as well. Yeah. Is that, that is exactly what you see where the lobbyists that are um, going knocking on the Senate's door are all owned by big business that you find that the even the the stimulus packages that were overwhelmingly printed on behalf of big businesses uh the first bailouts all went to big businesses um you know this whole quantitative easing thing printing money that's been going on since 08 or even beyond i can't remember now like there was the first person that was asked whether or not he wanted the money to be able to distribute well in society was warren buffett himself um so so yeah it's absolutely happening today and this is chesterton's hudge and gudge you know big business big state um conforming to one another mm. of course they're never at peace with one another mm -hmm. because they are after a profit after personal gain mm -hmm. but they're they're growing in, in unity together um <coughs> to, 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 i i mean i'll i mentioned lobbyists and it's it's just kind of funny is that um Philip Morris, the the cigarette company. Yeah. Actually, once they pretty much had dominated and monopolized the market, they sent lobbyists to DC convincing the politicians to make cigarette marketing illegal. Yeah, that's right. Which I just think is so funny because at that point, you know, small business can really rise up right. and market their way into into the black and, and into stability. So, so they, I mean, this is, and this just happens all the time. I have no doubt that part of the reason why we stayed in lockdown so long was because Amazon's lobbyists were knocking on the door and ensuring. But how does that relate to the devaluing of currency? Well, what happens, yeah, no, it's a great question. It, it, what that, the devaluing of currency is the initiation of this relationship. Okay. Gotcha. And it expands beyond that. Because the moment that money no longer has any kind of grounding in the natural order, you're saying, yeah, um, then it becomes available to this kind of technique. Right, yeah. Because it, at that point, it really comes up to, as long as people are still buying into the order that the state has is managing, which originally was perhaps good in the case of a REM, you know, where, where the king was trying to maintain custom the status quo what the people were doing maintaining the peace as, yeah. as andrew talks about then at that point there's there's something really good that's happening but it, with the devaluation of currency people don't really notice that the order is changing it looks the same it kind of feels the same but all of a sudden there's these tectonic shifts that are happening below the the surface that people don't notice and as long as people keep buying into the political parties governing as as they had been then the shifts can continue to occur gotcha yeah gotcha okay well so, so this is this is, this is, is relevant is, so rem is relevant take your time read the daemoneta uh get depressed then go back listen to the jubilees one get happy again there's a way out um but this is i think it's just the the, the techniques that we're talking about by which sovereignty casts its spell over us to welcome us into their way of seeing the world uh, happens at a very basic level with money mm -hmm. and, and being able to return to an order that God set. He gave the quantity of gold. He gave the quantity of silver. Uh, and, and also the, as it pertains to money is the same as when it pertains to uh in the natural order of family being primary instead of destroying it, you know, booing up your society. Okay, family. so I, I hear you, and I, and and it seems like fundamentally what you're saying is that when money loses its its tele, teleological end, its sort of reason for being um, as a means of exchange, mm -hmm. and that, for the sake of make ensuring that everybody is justly provided for right exactly and when as a result it is also um taken uh, removed from um the order of natural goods mm -hmm. so things that we perceive as part of god's gift mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. um then 
it becomes something new. So we use the same term, it's money. We yeah. might even have the same coins or bills or whatever. Right. We're still passing them around the same way. Yeah. Um, but now their worth is fundamentally available to being altered by um, the political powers that control us yep. in, in one way or the other. And I'm being very loose with political powers because I don't think it's like a guy. It's like whoever has yeah, power. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they become fundamentally like like technologies that, like we discussed earlier, give whoever has that power a kind of ability to control where otherwise he wouldn't. Mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. similar to like um, the census or the yeah. kind of alarm and anxiety of an ever-present uh, police force. Yeah. Like we are controlled through different technologies. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But, 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 but... Mm. Is gold really the answer? So what do we, I mean, I'm yeah. talking about our economy. You read a Rams, okay, you know, don't devalue the gold. Um, stop sending your your uh, guy out to get tin. Yeah. However, it yeah. just seems like, okay, like, what uh, you know, what am I supposed to do? Buy gold? Because isn't at this point we have so many people in the world and, and it just seems like gold itself is just like right up there with other commodities yeah. almost like it's not even well that's sadly true no i think that's yeah it. I okay think that is very so true. we have commodified gold right so um, then how could it how, you know like what is the answer how do you how do you the, the have... only, only way to have like uh, and now yeah. i'm speaking not um at ten thousand feet but just down personally sure, yeah. it's like is it is it answer then is they exchange my dollars and bills for gold and silver and you know this it's really tough because because people don't accept gold and silver at your local corner shop then no yeah right you know i uh, i would love to i you know i have plans one day it's gonna be huge get steubenville on the silver standard really <laughs> yeah it's cheaper than gold and we can start to pass it around a little sure. bit more it'd be great uh but this is you know a little bit of a pipe dream until i figure out a little bit better technique of how, how they do it and um, and if you're just buying gold and silver at the store, well, then you're misunderstanding what money is right, for. It's not, it's not for storing, you know, it's for a medium exchange. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure. Okay, cool. Honest. We are, we are um, once again, depressed and without a good answer. But <laughs> <laughs> I think there are companies, I'll give another shout out to like gold money and stuff where they used to, I guess they're, no, this sector's maybe shutting down. I'm not sure. I guess they have shut down already. The U actually used to be able to buy things with gold, mm -hmm. but they had a MasterCard where you could go to the coffee shop and swipe it. And, you know, the same weight, the equivalent of weight in gold was then immediately sold and transferred to a, a bank in, where it was exchanged for the, the equivalent of fiat currency. So you've pretty much bought your $3 cappuccino with gold. That was awesome. Regulators shut them down. Ah. Freaking regulators. Ah, oh, right. Right, yeah. Right. So I'm sorry that we're depressed. If you guys have any ideas, email us, mark at newpolity.com, jacob yeah. at newpolity.com. Definitely email Jacob on this one. Yeah, I'm really interested in it. If you have an idea, we'd love to try it out in Steubenville. I'll send you memes or something. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. See ya. <laughs>